Conservation of water is of paramount importance on Arrakis, where all life must survive by the law of the minimum. At no point in the narrative does Frank Herbert long let his reader forget this. Water conservation's vital importance permeates Dune from even before the Atreides set foot on Arrakis. The banquet scene in Dune is where we meet those involved in the power play politics of Arrakis, notably those involved with commerce and banking, which translates to those who control the resources of water and melange. More importantly, Herbert uses the banquet scene to put across many of the environmental necessities of Arrakis, and uses the dinner conversations to allow Liet Kynes to put forward many of his, or Herbert's, ecological ideas. He recognised in the group a still suit manufacturer down from Carthag, an electronics equipment importer, a water shipper whose summer mansion was near his polar cap factory, a representative of the Guild Bank, lean and remote that one, a dealer in replacement parts for spice mining equipment, a thin and hard faced woman whose escort service for off planet visitors reputedly operated as cover for various smuggling, spying and blackmail operations. Of particular note among the group are Liet Kynes, in his role as the Imperial Planetologist and Judge of the Change, a fat water seller by the name of Lingar Butte, and a smuggler called Esmar Tuik. The banquet scene is very revealing about both the Atreides and their guests' attitude to water, who more so than their hosts, understand its preciousness on Arrakis. Only Kynes acts as one who truly considers the ecological law of the minimum at all times. The banquet scene's purpose is primarily to highlight the political tensions and power groups with vested interests in the Atreides' takeover of Imperial Spice production. It also marks the necessity of doing business on such a world for the Atreides. Behind the veneer of politicking however, Herbert as always continues to illustrate the true harshness of Arrakis, and the need in particular for water conservation. The Duke gives a toast to his guests, which then causes them some embarrassment. As he has Gurney Hollock play a tune for them, he adds his own words that serve to extol and salute those who had died to bring the Atreides to their seemingly prominent position as governors of Arrakis. As he drinks his toast, the Duke carelessly lets some water spill over the brim of his cup, before emptying the remaining half on the floor. As is the custom, the guests are by necessity required to follow suit, and although Jessica is the first to follow her Duke in this custom, she is curious at the reluctant reactions of their guests, most especially that of Dr Kynes. This was clean, potable water, not something already cast away in a sopping tile. Reluctance to just discard it exposed itself in trembling hands, delayed reactions as nervous laughter and violent obedience to the necessity. One woman dropped her flagon, looked the other way as her male companion recovered it. Kynes though, caught her attention most sharply. The planetologist hesitated, then emptied his flagon into a container beneath his jacket. He smiled at Jessica as he caught her watching him, raised the empty flagon to her in a silent toast. He appeared completely unembarrassed by his action. Prior to the arrival of the Atreides, it had been the custom of the Harkonnen to flaunt their lack of need for water to the local populace. They did so by having several basins flanking the doorways draped with tiles. Here the Harkonnen would drink several cups of water and carelessly rinse their hands, spilling it on the ground. They would then throw the tiles into the puddles of water and allow beggars to squeeze what they could from them. Duke Leto I is particularly disgusted by this and changes the custom, allowing anyone who asks for it a free cup of water during the Atreides mealtimes though his apparent disregard for water conservation in pouring out his cup would seem to go against this notion. However, in doing so, Herbert demonstrates as we later find out, that it is indeed a high sign of respect to give water to the dead, as Paul does when he sheds tears for the death of Jamis. There are a number of staged exchanges in the ongoing conversations at the banquet table, some in part to demonstrate the nature of given power on Arrakis to the Atreides, others the product of espionage and intrigue. It is through Jessica's Bene Gesserit training 
that we observe much of the inner machinations of the feast, as she subtly detects falsehoods and staged responses, even identifying the guild banker's accent as originating on Giri Prime, despite his obvious training to mask his origins. Both the guild banker and the water seller make it unsubtly clear that they control water to a large degree on Arrakis, the Duke vowing to do something about the water supply so that Butte may not hold a club over his head. There is here an awareness of hydraulic despotism by the Atreides, and the possibility of it causing them great harm. When the Duke states that it is his intention to help transform the environment of Arrakis so that plants may grow again easily in the open and water would be available freely, this is not from any ecological desire to see the world transformed, but simply to remove the ability for any man to hold a club over his head. The economics of ecology is fully on display in the banquet scene, especially in the form of the fear of hydraulic despotism that may be emplaced by the water sellers. As Butte the water seller is strangely arrogant and rude to his host, Leto realises that this is perhaps the very reason that the man was able to do business with the Harkonnen when they governed Arrakis, yet was able to remain outside of their usually dictatorial iron grip of control. Leto held anger in check, staring at the man. Thoughts raced through his mind. It had taken bravery to challenge him in his own ducal castle, especially since they now had Butte's signature over a contract of allegiance. The action had taken, also, knowledge of personal power. Water was, indeed, power here. If water facilities were mined, for instance, ready to be destroyed at a signal, the man looked capable of such a thing. Destruction of water facilities might well destroy Arrakis. That could well have been the club this Butte held over the Harkonnens. The awareness of hydraulic despotism is of particular interest with Frank Herbert's Dune series, and it manifests itself in both the form of water on Arrakis and melange within the Greater Imperium. Dune is regarded as the foremost book in fiction to present this concept, sometimes also referred to as Oriental despotism. The term was coined by Karl August Wittfogel in Oriental Despotism, a comparative study of total power, and refers to the ability of a nation that utterly controls a particular resource, such as water or oil, and can cut off that resource at will, to the detriment of other nations or societies. The most recent example of this is the withholding of gas supplies to the Ukraine by the Russian gas supply company Gazprom from 2005 onwards. Economic ecology is also at work by the Fremen here, through the agency of Kynes and Chuik the Smuggler. Most worlds in the Imperium have weather control and sophisticated satellite systems, but Arrakis is one of the few worlds where this does not occur. Prior to moving to Arrakis, Paul asks Thufir Howitt why this is the case. He responds, Arrakis has special problems, costs are higher, and there be maintenance and the like. The Guild wants a dreadful high price for satellite control. This statement is a falsehood perpetuated by the Guild, for the real reason that there are no weather control satellites is because the Fremen bribe them with huge amounts of melange to keep it that way. As the Guild depend on the spice to navigate, their interest in stockpiling melange is paramount to them above all other considerations. As long as the Fremen pay their enormous bribes in melange, the Guild will refuse to put in place any such kind of satellite system. This in turn allows the Fremen to hide their movements and numbers, and continue their process of ecological transformation unabated by any political or military force in the Imperium. Their partnership with certain smugglers is essential to this, and again the smugglers would not be able to operate in the way they do with satellite coverage. As the conversation proceeds at the dinner table, the Guild Banker continues to use the discussion to bait the Atreides, and in particular Dr Kynes who is known for his Fremen sympathies. The conversation begins discussing the nature of the birds of Arrakis, who are consistently carrion eaters and who drink blood when water is not available. This is an unsubtle reference to the Fremen and their customs. Liet Kynes coolly interjects in the conversation, bringing an ecological explanation for this behaviour, highlighting the necessity for this 
in terms of life's requirements within a difficult energy system. Do you mean, sir, that these birds are cannibals? That's an odd question, young master, the banker said. I merely said the birds drink blood. It doesn't have to be the blood of their own kind, does it? It was not an odd question, Paul said, and Jessica noted the brittle riposte quality of her training exposed in his voice. Most educated people know that the worst potential competition for any young organism can come from its own kind. He deliberately forked a bite of food from his companion's plate, ate it. They are eating from the same bowl, they have the same basic requirements. The banker stiffened, scowled at the duke. Do not make the error of considering my son a child, the duke said, and he smiled. Jessica glanced around the table, noted that Butte had brightened, that both Kynes and the smuggler, Chuick, were grinning. It's a rule of ecology, Kynes said, that the young master appears to understand quite well. The struggle between life elements is the struggle for the free energy of a system. Blood's an efficient energy source. The banker put down his fork, spoke in an angry voice. It's said that the Fremen scum drink the blood of their dead. Kynes shook his head, spoke in a lecturing tone. Not the blood, sir, but all of a man's water ultimately belongs to his people, to his tribe. It's a necessity when you live near the Great Flat. All water is precious there, and the human body is composed of some 70% water by weight. A dead man, surely, no longer requires that water. The conversation here ends with the banker insulting Kynes, who asks the man if he is challenging him. The banker backs down, losing face, but the poise and actions of those at the table that are ready to flee from possible violence are collective with the exception of Butte and Tuick. Constantly in a state of observation, Jessica notes that the water seller is enjoying the banker's discomfort, but that Chuick stands ready to aid Kynes if such is the necessity. His body language reveals to her that there is an accord of some kind between the planetologist and the smuggler. It also reveals that Kynes' attitude to the Atreides has softened somewhat from their initial encounters, whether this is from his own Fremen beliefs of the prophecy of the Lisan al Gaib, or because he senses that they share his desire to transform the environment of Arrakis to make it more hospitable to human life. Jessica also notes Kynes' attitude towards the banker and his readiness for violence, realising that he is a casual killer and guesses that this was a Fremen quality. After the overshadowing of potential violence, the conversation resumes, with Jessica directing it towards the importance of water conservation. At this point, Kynes continues with providing more insight into the ecology of Arrakis and hinting at the projects he and the Fremen have commenced. Here, he discusses Liebig's Law of the Minimum. Kynes looked at Jessica, said, The newcomer to Arrakis frequently underestimates the importance of water here. You are dealing, you see, with the law of the minimum. She heard the testing quality in his voice, said, Growth is limited by that necessity which is present in the least amount, and, naturally, the least favourable condition controls the growth rate. It's rare to find members of a great house aware of planetological problems, Kind said. Water is the least favourable condition for life on Arrakis. And remember that growth itself can produce unfavourable conditions unless treated with extreme care. Liebig's Law of the Minimum, or Theory of Minimum, was developed by the German botanist Karl Sprengel, and was a concept of agricultural theory. It is named Liebig's Law of the Minimum after Justus von Liebig, a German chemist who later popularised the theory. Liebig illustrated this idea by showing a barrel with staves of varying sizes, demonstrating that the barrel can only contain water up to the point of the shortest of these staves. As Kynes explains here, growth is controlled in any given environment by the least available resource, and on Arrakis this is water. Jessica picks up on Kynes' use of the word growth, questioning if Arrakis can have a more orderly water cycle to improve conditions of life, an idea that is scoffed at by the water seller Butte. Butte's response to this is to call Kynes a dreamer, stating that all of the bordery evidence is against him. Herbert has Kynes respond to this in a manner that echoes the ideas of the ecologist Paul Sears, stating that laboratory evidence blinds people to the fact 
that on Arrakis they are dealing with systems that exist out of doors, where plants and animals carry on their normal existence. A point of conjecture that Sears brings up is that modern man no longer follows the model that nature provides for existing in harmony with the world around him. He states, in producing his crops he rarely follows the balanced model that exists in nature. Instead, he is coming to take the factory and the bacteriological laboratory as his model. Leto asks Keynes what it would take to begin the process of creating a self-sustaining system on Arrakis, to begin the process of change and improve the conditions for the creation of more water. Kynes explains that this requires building up to 3% of the green plant element on Arrakis involved in forming carbon compounds as foodstuffs, we've started the cyclic system, but also explains that water shortage is not the only problem in realising this goal. When asked what projects the planetologist has undertaken, Kynes states that there has been much time to set up what he calls the Tansley effect, a process of creating many small laboratorial experiments on an amateur basis from which he is drawing scientific data. The unusual chemical interchanges on Arrakis produce a great deal of oxygen, which, unbeknownst to most, is actually a byproduct of the sandworms. The water cellar Butte states firmly that there simply isn't enough water on Arrakis to begin such a transformation. Duke Lido asks if this is true, but Kynes conceals what he knows, faking uncertainty and telling the Duke that this may be the case. This angers Leto who wants a yes or no answer, but the political and economic factors represented by those attending the dinner make Kynes reluctant to discuss this any further in public. Leto is called away from the dinner and Paul is asked to take over as host. Another exchange between the guild banker and Paul ensues which again nearly results in violence at the table, this time with Chuik and Kynes openly supporting Paul. The final ecological discussion of the banquet scene features much deception on the part of Dr Kynes when the conversation turns to the uninhabited regions of the southern deep desert. His tale of the deep desert is reminiscent of a story to scare children, and its obvious intent is to suggest that death comes to those who dare venture there. Butte the water seller interjects suggesting the Fremen travel there, and that they have hunted out soaks and sip wells even in the southern latitudes. Kynes states rather too quickly that these are mere rumours, but his deception is picked up by Paul and Jessica with their Bene Gesserit training. The banquet scene allows Herbert to present the nature of the precarious environment of Arrakis from the viewpoints of those who live on the planet but are not Fremen. While Kynes is a Fremen, his conversation follows only the areas of general planetary ecology, doing his best to present false views of the real ecological work that is being undertaken. Anything that may indicate the real levels of water available or the Fremen's geomorphic ecological projects are concealed from those at the dinner, especially as their interests would run contrary to his own dream for Arrakis. The banquet scene does however serve one very important purpose, which is to strongly indicate the political and economic nature of ecology.